Thank you very much for coming today morning. And I'll continue my discussion. We started yesterday on the topic of comparing. Basically, we discussed the theme of not so, what do good people do when bad things happen to them. I talked based on the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. And the topic was comparing Ram Lila and Krishna Lila. So yesterday there was not much Krishna Lila. But actually it's uh, what we are talking about is how Krishna manifests in the devotees' lives. So it's not directly Krishna Lila. Today I'll talk about how the Lord acts. So basically the topic which I'll speak on. Yesterday I spoke about how this great adversity for both the characters in the Ramayana and in the Mahabharata, that they suddenly exiled and had to live in the forest. So then how did they process it? So the topic we'll discuss is how do we see God's hand when bad things happen in our life? How do we process those bad things? Is God the cause of everything that happens to us, including the bad things? <coughs> These are very complicated questions. And one, I'll start with one key point and then I'll elaborate with respect to the storyline. Whenever anything happens, we try to find some cause for why it is happening. And that, say, right now a sparrow had come here. The sparrow was chirping. Now you say, okay, a sparrow is here. You could say, what is the cause of that? One cause is the windows are open. That's why the sparrow has come. So you could just trace the presence of the sparrow to one cause, the window is open. But you could escalate it further and say, oh, the weather is cold and the sparrow also wants warmth. That's why the weather is here. So you could put the same event in different causal boxes. One causal box is the window is open, that's why the sparrow is here. Second causal box is uh, the weather is cold, that's why the sparrow is here. A third causal box could be that maybe there are some food crumbs lying over here. So because the, this place is not so clean, food crumbs are lying, so because of uncleanness, the sparrows have come. Uh, another causal box could be that maybe the sparrow population has increased. <laughs> for whatever reason. And there's a sparrows are everywhere and they are here also. So, like that, the same event can be placed in different causal boxes. And based on the causal box that we put it in, we will determine what action to do. So, if, okay, the window is open, let's close the window. Of course, after the sparrow goes out, not before. <laughs> so, then, that's the way we deal with it. Another way could be that, okay, now maybe we need to keep the place clean. Or maybe uh, we need to consider, maybe we have to create some bird park or bird sanctuary or something like that for the, for the birds to stay, whatever. So based on which causal framework or causal box we put a particular event in, we choose the appropriate action according to. And most of the times, when people have mental breakdowns, that usually happens because they place the event in a, in a destructive causal box. What do I mean by destructive causal box? That, <clears throat> say, I, I was giving a seminar in, in New Jersey on mental health and spirituality. So after that one girl, Western girl, she was talking, and American, she said that how she sank into depression. So she was studying in a university, and along with that, she was waiting tables just to earn some money. And one day she was carrying a glass of water for a client, for a customer, and the glass slipped from her hand. And it fell down, it spilled, and it cracked, and uh, it's a mess. And she said, that time, the thought came in my mind. If I can't carry even a glass of water, how am I going to live my life? 
Now, how many from how many of our hands water has spilled? A glass of water has spilled. From my it has happened when it is near a computer. <laughs> then it is a disaster. <laughs> so it has happened to all of us. But okay, now that could be placed in so many causal boxes. Because maybe a hand was wet, or maybe the glass was slippery, or maybe suddenly somebody called out, or maybe I was just inattentive. But how many of us escalated it into the causal box that if I can't carry a glass, what is my self worth? So why are you putting it in that box? So, so many times when we have, when we're dealing with people, sometimes people take some small thing very personally. And say, you know, you, I think this person is very angry with me. Why? He says, I passed by them and they didn't even look at me. <laughs> well, it, it might be, they might be, they might be having a lot, lot going on in their lives. Isn't it? So what happens is, if we, in general, if we are mentally stable, then we almost subconsciously place events in the most constructive causal box. In the most constructive causal box. And that's how we find out, how can I function? But when we are mentally unstable or mentally sick, then the same events, we start placing them in less constructive or sometimes destructive causal boxes also. And when we place something in the destructive causal box, I can't carry even a glass of water. What will I do with my life? It can be overpowering. So, when we, start, when we go through difficulties in life, we need to learn what is the most constructive causal box in which to put the particular distress that we are going through. So, if we don't learn this, then that's, that's one way our mind can destroy us. Sometimes the mind destroys us by just giving destructive desires within us. Uh, and that is a very direct attack. We have some desires which we know are harmful for us. But a subtler way the mind destroys us is by giving destructive interpretations to events. When we have a destructive interpretation, that means it places us in a destructive causal box. And then we just become completely disheartened. So what are the possible causal boxes in which we could put difficulties? So for example, now <coughs> we discussed in the Ramayana, when Ram was exiled to the forest. Lakshman was putting it in the causal box. The king is infatuated with his young wife. And that's why he is exiling him. Ram said, no. Our father is a, is a person who is a word of honor. And he is honoring his word even at great personal cost to him. So you see, the event is the same. Ram is being exiled. But one causal box makes Dashrath the victimizer. The other causal box sees Dashrath also as a victim. It's not exactly a victim, but as helpless in that situation. So what causal box we put someone put something in can, we can lead to a 180 degree opposite interpretation of the same event. So normally, whenever something something odd happens. We immediately try to find out what is the cause of this. See, if I speak something right now and every one of you start glaring at me, not just staring, but glaring, then immediately I think, what happened? Did I speak something wrong? Or maybe, you know, there's somebody behind me who is doing something strange and you are glaring at that person. And I don't know. So what happens is that we all have to, we all consciously, subconsciously place events in certain frameworks, in certain causal boxes. And in this, this is how we process life. And if we can learn to place events in the, in the most constructive causal boxes, we can go through almost any difficulties. 
and if we do if our mind starts placing events in destructive causal boxes then even the smallest of difficulty can knock us out so that is where we talk about mental resilience or inner resilience resilience comes by the capacity to place events in constructive causal boxes so what are these causal boxes i give two examples of the of say lakshman and ram now ram placed him in a box by which he could maintain his respect for his father and still accept the duty which he had to do the difficult duty it was going to the forest now in the case of yudhishthir we talked about how how where that he was also to be blamed or something or he was at least made a mistake he got carried away so now he could have placed it how could i have been so dumb and he could have beaten himself up by it there is a difference between i am dumb and i did a dumb thing so yes we all sometimes do act in foolish ways but that doesn't make us intrinsically bad or foolish so here i like to differentiate between weakness and wickedness weakness is where all of us have certain impurities within us it can be lust it can be anger it can be greed it can be envy and because of these we sometimes do something bad when we do something bad after doing it immediately our in, our conscience kicks in like hey you should not have done that you should not have spoken like this you should not have done that so that is we could say our conditioning temporarily our impurity temporarily overpowers us we go off track and then we come back on track whereas wickedness is where a person does wrong and delights in doing wrong in fact the person does wrong in such a way that they think my cleverness is to cover my tracks exposed so that nobody will catch me so now yudhishthir's gambling what was that a result of weakness hmm? duryodhana's inciting yudhishthir to gamble was wickedness so what happens is that sometimes somebody does something wrong and then we label them based on that such a terrible person we treat them as if they are wicked See, there are some people who may be wicked but that's very few most people are not wicked most people have weakness and weakness means that they want to do the right thing but sometimes their impurities their conditions overpower them so yudhishthir saw that and okay he accepted it now now <clears throat> when we talk about god here as i said we are going to focus our the driving question in this whole series is what do good people do when bad things happen to them so when bad things happen to us where do we place god in that causal framework in that causal box if we see god sometimes intervenes in miraculous ways and some skeptical people will say that oh, these miracles are un- they are unbelievable they can't happen oh, it's what is the what is the scientific what is the rational explanation for this if krishna lifts up govardhan hill and then somebody asks no how how can he do that how can somebody if krishna lifted it up on his finger how did krishna find the center of gravity of govardhan to place his finger over <laughs> well krishna doesn't need to find the center of gravity because he is the source of gravity so he so miracles are not against science they are above science they are above science science is the law is the operational principles by which the lord has arranged for the world to function but he is above those operational principles and he can adjust them and record but in general god doesn't do that and if somebody expects god's help in terms of the operational principles the the operational principles will be changed well 
that's unlikely to happen. Say, if somebody jumps down from a maybe 20 story building and they say, God will protect me. Well, that is the domain of gravity. If you put gravity to test, gravity will put you to rest. <laughs> <laughs> How God did protect me? Well, God gave you intelligence. Use that intelligence. Isn't it? So, in general, a devotee doesn't expect that God intervene within the normal operational principles of the world. The world operates according to certain principles, and we have to intelligently work within that. So, it's not that. A, just because we are practicing bhakti, God will change the rules of the game for us. He may give us the intelligence so that we can play the game better. But not that he will change the rules of the game for us. So if something bad happens to us, so now I'll put these two points together. First point was that we have to put things in the most constructive causal framework. And then God can change the, God can Suspend the principles of operational principles of nature, the laws of nature. But God usually does not. So then, with, with these two principles, the whole thing we are discussing is how do we process adversities in our life? So how did Ram process? How did Yudhishthir process? And where, how did Krishna come into the picture over here? So in the case of Ram, he is himself the divine descended on the world. But although he's the divine descended here, he doesn't act as if he's omnipotent. The idea is in the Ramayana, he's demonstrating how an ideal human being lives. An ideal human being, if the human being has uh, omnipotence, then you may say, he's God, what, what? I mean, he can do anything. But so he doesn't act as if he's omnipotent. Sometimes he does manifest extraordinary powers. But even then, it's more of an extraordinary discipline. <laughs> <laughs> That's an something is there behind? Okay. <laughs> <My stand. laughs> That's an interesting causal box to put it in. <laughs> <laughs> so now uh, so Ram, he displays how he's an ideal human being. Not by summoning divine powers and then dealing with all situations. Rather, he demonstrates how to respond to adversity with grace, with dignity. So Ram doesn't blame anyone. I mean, what does Ram do? He sees it as destiny. So this is, I'll come to this in a few minutes, but let's take up this incident that Lakshman is saying, Lakshman is initially angry. How could Dashar do this? And then he says, it's not Dashar. It's Kaikai who had given the word, who, who, who has demanded this. So yeah, he says, Kaikai is so selfish. It's for no fault of yours. She's sending you to the forest. Yeah, he says, don't speak badly about her. You know how much she loved me. Uh, although she's my stepmother, her love for me is as much as the love of my own mother for me. It was like the Ganga flowing incessantly. Lakshman is still angry. He said, that's why I can't understand. How did the Ganges River dry up in one night? Then Ram replies, that's why when I heard her speaking those harsh words, I understood this is the will of destiny. When people's behavior changes inexplicably, why are they doing like this? There is something bigger going on. See, this is the middle of destiny. And then Lakshman says, well, he's angry and he says, what destiny? There are only cowards who call injustice as destiny and accept it. These heroes fight against injustice. Ram says, actually, for me, my primary concern is my duty. As a duty to my father, I was ready to ascend the throne. As a duty to my father, I will go to the forest. And as a part of that duty, 
this explanation, that this happened because of this too. That will help me, and I'm putting those this the round of the same thing, that a part of that explanation, the explanation that this happened because of destiny, will help Ram to do the duty most gracefully, without resentment, without uh, any, without any too much hard feelings. Now, in the case of you, I'll I'll give a philosophical framework for this a little later. But here, Ram introduces the, introduces the concept of destiny. Now, what do we actually mean by destiny? As I said that, there are different causal boxes in which we can place events. And usually we think of karma as simple and linear. I do action A and I get the result B. So, yeah, for example, I eat food and I get energy. So, yes, that's true, but it's not just that simple. There are other factors which are sometimes invisible and sometimes become visible. So, I may eat food and I get energy. But suppose I have got some disease because of which I can't digest food. Then I may eat the food, but I still don't get any energy. So, Gahana Karma Gati, the work. The workings of karma are so complex that they can give even complex thinkers a complex. <laughs> so, we normally think that this action, this result. But I do this action and I don't get this result. Then what's going on? Then, the principle of destiny helps us to expand the framework. See, the, the situations that we meet in our lives, the results that we get, are not determined by our present actions alone. It is our present actions plus our past actions. Now at a simple level, we can understand this that suppose somebody, uh, two students study for an exam. Both of them study maybe, it's the exam they study, both of them study for say 100 hours, totally in a semester or whatever. But in that 100 hours, one student gets 100 out of 100. And other students study just as much but they get just 60. Now you can think, why didn't you study? No, I studied. Now, all of us, to some extent, we are, from a material perspective, you know, we are playthings in a genetic lottery. Our IQ is more or less determined at birth. We can increase it a little bit, but from 100, you can make it 110, 120. But somebody has 150, 160 IQ, then it's, it's a great gift, or whatever is a higher IQ. So, those of us who, who achieve great things in life, to some extent, we start with some brilliance. So, it's not just the amount that you study that determines the brilliance. We have certain IQ. And now, from the perspective of karma, we understand that this is not just a genetic lottery, it is our past life karma which determines the resources that we get in this life. So the IQ level that somebody has, that, so you could say broadly, if you want achievement in life, there is talent plus commitment leads to achievement. So the commitment is what is in our hand right now. Two people may put the same commitment, but if the two have different talents, then the achievements will be different. And the talent is just a gift. So, it's not that simple that my action produces the result. So now my talent is determined by my past karma. And we could say from this life's perspective, that's the destiny. By destiny, sometimes we get some good things, some good resources to move in our life journey. And by destiny, sometimes we get some limitations. So usually when we function, I eat food, I get energy. It's a simple, my action and the result. So the role of destiny over there is almost invisible. But sometimes it becomes extremely visible. I eat, and then two people may eat the same food, and one of them gets a severe uh, food poisoning. Other, nothing happens. So there are, there are other, other things going on over there. So the ho whole point is that Ram, Ram, when he says destiny, okay, why did I didn't do anything to anger this person? But why has this person come against me like this now? It's not so much 
And now Ram is also not telling Kaikri is a bad person. Because Kaikri is not a bad person. Kaikri has weakness and that is manipulated by Mantra. So he doesn't hold it against him. He accepts it and sees it as his turn. So sometimes when beyond our control, beyond our provocation, something terrible happens to us. So one causal framework that can help us to accept it is destiny. That okay, something really destined to happen. And just love it. Just let me accept it. Now accept it doesn't mean passivity. Accept it means that that which is unchangeable, I accept it so that I can focus on what is changeable. The situation that Ram had to go to the forest was unchangeable. Now, with what consciousness he will go to the forest, that is changeable. And he tries to change that. He goes with as good a consciousness as possible. Now let's look at Yudhishthira. And let's see how Krishna comes into the picture over here. So, if we consider when the Pandavas in the forest, or during this whole incident, when Draupadi is about to be dishonored, uh, the vicious Kauravas try to disrobe her. At that time, Krishna offers us an, an in, inexhaustible robe. But nobody sees Krishna over there. It's like she calls out and she just desperately calls out and her robe just becomes inexhaustible. And then her disrober says that her robe is inexhaustible and her disrober becomes exhausted. <laughs> and then he collapses. They give up the attempt. That's Krishna's miraculous intervention at one level. But all of us in general, in our lives, some of us might be fortunate enough to see some miraculous intervention of Krishna in our lives. But for most of us, we might not see that miraculous intervention where apparently the laws of nature, the operational principles, are suspended. Now we could say that, okay, if Krishna intervened to protect their property, couldn't Krishna have intervened to stop Yudhishthira from gambling only? Couldn't Krishna have intervened and made sure that Yudhishthira wins the gambling match, although he is not skilled? See, when God intervenes, that's up to God. We can't predict that, we can't demand that. So we have to do the best that we can do. And it's significant when I said Yudhishthira had weakness. So when Yudhishthira was in the forest, now there were, so he practiced and learned gambling in the forest. So he already got so much trouble in gambling because of him. Why are you practicing and learning now? Because he knew that Duryodhan might challenge him again for a gambling match. And he wanted to be prepared for it. So he didn't resent or demand, Krishna, you should intervene and protect me. So generally, here I'll talk about. I talked about the framework of destiny. Why do bad things happen sometimes? Is destiny. Another way of looking at destiny is when something happens to us, something bad happens to us, there are broadly three factors, three causal boxes in which we could put that event. It is everything that happened, is everything that happened God's will? What do you think? Is everything that happens God's will? Sorry? God sanctions. Yes. There's a difference between God willing and God sanctioning. So what is it? Here we could say there are three factors by which actions happen in this world. There is God's will, there is free will, and there is he will. <laughs> God's will, free will, and he will. So, God God's will is ultimately supreme. So now, but God's will is supreme doesn't mean that His is the only will that exists. He has given every one of us free will. And there is, now again, it might seem technical, but it's simple. See, there is free will and there is freedom. Even a prisoner has free will. But the prisoner does not have freedom. Freedom is the area to exercise the freedom. The, free, the prisoner has free will. 
but the prisoner doesn't have the physical freedom to go wherever they want. So now why is that? Maybe the prisoner has done something wrong because of which they have been put in that jail so where their freedom is restricted. So they maybe have abused their freedom, maybe uh, harmed someone, stolen from someone and that's why their freedom is not that is decreased, is curtailed. Even within a jail also, some, uh, sometimes somebody might uh, live in a comfortable place, somebody may be in a dungeon where they can't even see the light. So it depends on what kind of wrongdoing they have done. So our free will is never taken away. But based on our karma, we are all given different degrees of freedom. Freedom means different different sizes of the area over which we can exercise our freedom. That is determined by our past karma. Say, if I become angry or you become angry, you know, you might just yell at some people or you might just, uh, if you didn't become physically angry, you might physically attack someone. If the president of America becomes angry, might press a few nuclear buttons and countries can get destroyed. So what is happening over here? We all have free will. We all can become angry. But based on karma, the degree of freedom that we have, the area over which we can act according to our free will varies. Now within this area, so somebody now somebody is wicked. I already talked about somebody is uh, wicked or even if somebody has weakness, then they misuse their free will. And then what they do during the misuse of their free will, that is not God's doing. That is God's sanctioning. God sanctioning. Why? Say for example, the Holocaust is a terrible event which happened in recent history. Of course, the Jewish Holocaust is what is widely known. Uh, in the medieval times, there has been a Hindu Holocaust where so many Hindus were killed. There are so many communities that have been wiped out across the world. But when something like this happens, people may ask, where is God? Well, it is that those particular kings or heads of state who did that horrible thing, by their past karma, they were meant to have a certain phenomenal amount of power. And that power they had, how they used it is up to them. And if they abuse it, then people get victimized of it. And it's atrocious, it's outrageous, and such dictators, such abusers of power need to be punished. But the point is, this is not God doing it. It is people misusing their free will. So what we do are, with our free will cannot be ascribed to God. In the government of his chapter, 13, 14, 15, Krishna talks about what is called etiology. Etiology is the study of causation. What is the actual cause of things? In medicine, it's often the etiology of a disease. How does the disease originate? So in philosophy, also etiology means the study of causation. So Krishna says that I am not responsible for the good and bad things that people do. They are doing it based on the kind of coverings that are there in their consciousness. If somebody does bad, it is because their consciousness is covered. And they are misusing their free will. So that what the, the, the three factors I talked about them: God's will. I talked about two of them: God will and free will. The third one, evil. evil. Now, what is evil? There is no such uh, being like Satan who is out to make us do bad things. But there is, of course, the illusory energy Maya, but she is not evil. Her purpose is ultimately to test us. So. I was in Australia and somebody asked a question. If God wants us to do good things, then why are the bad options so many in the world? So I said, that's how it is in every multiple choice exam. <laughs> <laughs> so, five options. Four wrong. The student can say, by probability, my chance of getting it right is only 20%. And you expect me to get 40% to pass. It's unfair. 
Also you. <laughs> But it's not based on probability. It's based on intelligence. It's based on preparation. So in the world, we have given many options because we have free will, and free will itself has no meaning if there is no potential to use that free will freely. So there are there many people have lower desires, and accordingly there are options to fulfill those lower desires. So evil means that if somebody repeatedly does something wrong, then they become habituated to it. So evil in the sense is like you know earlier I said wickedness, where people do wrong and they don't even feel that they're doing wrong. That's what I want to do. I get joy in that. I get joy in hurting people. So that is that. I get a sense of power. I just feel how powerful I am. I can cause so much pain. So that is very dangerous. So how many people have evil? At that time, so now you could say at one level even weakness is evil. But weakness is not exactly evil. Weakness is just impurity which makes us do wrong things. But wickedness is there. That impurity has become so deeply entrenched that that's our default action, and we don't even feel bad about it. So now going back to these three things: God will, free will, and evil. We are trying to see how we can process the events, the bad thing that happened in our life. How can we process them in a way which helps us to grow? So in the forest. Krishna at one level in in the assembly Krishna saves Draupadi, but then the events keep unfolding, and then eventually the Pandavas are exiled, and then Krishna comes there, and the Pandavas in the forest Krishna comes to meet them. Draupadi breaks down and she says, Krishna, I'm your friend, I'm your relative, I'm your devotee. I call out to you for help. Why didn't you come to help me? Krishna doesn't have a holier than thou attitude. How dare you question my plan? My plan is perfect. No. Krishna, he says, I didn't know about the gambling match. A de- uh, evil demon Shalva had attacked Dwarka, and I was busy defending Dwarka. As soon as I came to know about what had happened, I have immediately come to help, and I have heard not only about the terrible thing that happened to you, but how gracefully you stuck to dharma throughout. He said, "Oh, Draupadi, rest assured that those who have wronged you will be punished. Those who have wronged you will be punished." So here we see what has happened. Something terrible happened to Draupadi. Now, she could say, "Why did God make this happen? But God didn't make it happen. What Krishna does is he helps her to see that this is the result of evil. That Duryodhan was evil, and he did this, and he needs to be punished, and he will be punished." So, again, as I talked about weakness and wickedness, so we could say whenever we misuse our free will, that's weakness. But when we become so habituated to misusing our free will that we don't even think we are doing anything wrong, and we delight in doing it, that's that becomes evil. So, when the, there is weakness, for weakness there can be forgiveness. For wickedness to give forgiveness is foolishness. For wickedness there has to be justice. There has to be punishment. So what Duryodhan did was, was what? Was it weakness or wickedness? Wickedness. wickedness. What Kaikeyi did? What was that? Mm-hmm. Wickedness. So neither Ram nor Dashrath nor Lakshman nor Bharat they ever think that Kaikeyi should be punished. There is weakness. It was out of character for Kaikeyi. She was just he got influenced and he did something. He did. He did something terrible. And she was profoundly remorseful. And she said that eventually when Bharat. Chided her, what have you done? She realized she came out of her own stupor, and then she was so remorseful that she herself came with Bharat, asking Ram to request Ram, please come back with me. So 
so he overcome her weakness and that's why there is no punishment for the result but for Duryodhan a punishment was appointed because there was no weakness but weakness now having said this and let's let's now come to how do we process when something bad is happening in our life say there is God will there is free will and there is evil so sometimes if we do, we have too sentimental an understanding of bhakti then what happens is we start seeing things in inappropriate contexts so for example one devotee said to me i said today morning i was going to office and my car got punctured he says i know today morning i didn't chant attentively so krishna punctured my car <laughs> really <laughs> now can you really read krishna's mind like that you know krishna did this because of that well there is no need to escalate everything to the level of krishna there is no need to escalate everything to the level of krishna it's okay maybe you are tired you didn't pay attention to it they say let's put it in terms of karma and suppose say on a cold night like we have now somebody eats 10 ice creams mm-hmm. and the next morning ice cream <laughs> <laughs> i have a terrible throat and then now is this because of past karma yes past karma but past nights karma <laughs> you don't have to where there is an immediate explanation available there is no need to escalate it to some bigger level yeah i ate wrongly and that's why i got this so prabhupad also when the devotees in uh, london wanted to do a big rath yatra so they were replicated the car design of the devotees in san francisco where the rath kachari car festival chari festival but they got a much bigger uh, tower bigger spire on top and what happened the weight was so much that when the rath car was moving it just wheels crumbled and it was a pr disaster they called everybody to for the festival and the devotees wrote to prabhupad said prabhupad did our car crumble because of our poor devotion and prabhupad said it crumbled because of your poor engineering <laughs> <laughs> so don't escalate everything to krishna hmm? so if you start now we may say i don't be meant to see krishna's hand in everything yes we are meant to but that is in a way that is favorable for our krishna so basically now uh let's look at it this way that when we are going through difficulties god uh, god's role can be broadly in three categories he is the cause of the difficulty he is the comforter amid the difficulty and he is the cure for the difficulty there are three possibilities now when we start seeing god as the cause of our difficulty then in that case what is happening it may be very easy for us it may be it, we may become resentful of god and god doesn't want the evil of anyone he's a surudam sarva bhutam he's a well wisher of everyone so if something bad is happening to ascribe it to god it, it may well be philosophically also wrong and definitely is devotionally wrong now here's again this might again be a little complicated and we'll have question answers to address this there is a difference between the cause of something and the purpose of something the cause is where it comes from the purpose is where it takes, takes us so we can say that god is the purpose of everything that happens even when bad things happen sometimes those bad things they in, they impel us to take more shelter of krishna so in that sense for everything that happens 
the universe is arranged in such a way that the purpose is that we go closer to God. The purpose is that we evolve spiritually. And that is Krishna's expertise that even when bad things happen, he can make his plan work through them. But that doesn't mean he's the cause of the suffering. He is not the cause of the bad things happening. When Ravan abducted Sita, it's not that it was Ram who came in the form of Ravan and abducted Sita. It was not Ram doing it. It was Ravan doing it. It is not God's will. It is evil. So don't, if we escalate everything to God in our, in our in terms of a causal box, then that can seriously damage our devotion. So we have to find the appropriate causal box. In, in, as I said, there is no necessarily right or wrong causal box. Say the sparrow came in. Is it because of the window is open or is it because of the weather being cold? It could be both. So I start talking about, we have to look at what is the most constructive causal box. Constructive means that which uh, based on which we can do something constructive. If the weather has gone down, there's nothing constructive that I can do about it. Okay, maybe then, okay, if I'm in charge of the city, maybe I might decide I want to create a bird sanctuary. Mm -hmm. But if I'm only in the, the hospital, this temple, and then I'm concerned that the sparrow might distract or something like that, the bird might distract, then we might decide to close the windows. So it's not so much which causal box is right and which causal box is wrong, but which causal box is the most constructive. So, with respect to Yudhishthir, he doesn't put the gambling in that causal box. I am such a fool. I am worthless. I can't be a leader. Let me just quit everything. And nor does Draupadi put it in the causal box. No, I, I, God doesn't help anyone. So, what is the use of worshipping God? So, <clears throat> imagine that, say, a tiger. Is chasing you a deer, and the tiger is close and close, closing in on the deer. Now, of course, animals don't have their consciousness developed enough to perceive God. But suppose, hypothetically, they have. So the deer is praying, "Oh God, please save me! Please let this deer not kill me! Please let this, ti uh, this tiger not kill me!" And the tiger is praying, "Oh God." I am dying of starvation. Please don't let this deer flee away. I need to save my life. Please let me catch it and eat it. Now whose prayer will God fulfill? <laughs> so it's here, it depends on the skill. That if the deer gets caught, that means the deer was not skilled enough, the tiger was skilled enough. The deer slips away. That means the tiger was not skilled enough, the deer was skilled enough. So we want to be kind in the interaction between people when things happen, if you start bringing God into every interaction then we will not be able to function properly. In the Kunti Maharani's prayers, I think it's 1828, she says, Manye tum kalam ishanam anadididhanam vibhum samam charantam sarvatra bhutanam yannitha kali So he says, my dear Lord, that you are Samam Charantam Sarvatra. You are equal to everyone. And when there are quarrels, there are the conflicts among people, that is because of their mutual interactions. Bhutanam Yanditha Kali Kali Quarrel happens. So when one person becomes angry with another person, one person does something terrible to the other person. So that's not God doing it. So that person doing it. So the, Maha, so the Mahabharata, what is the causal framework in which uh, Yudhishthira puts it? Yeah, there was a mistake, a terrible mistake, but there was a mistake. I will not repeat it. With respect to Draupadi, she puts it in. It is not that God did not help me, but rather this person was evil. There was no evil, and that's why he did what he did. So when we put things in the appropriate constructive boxes, uh, in the appropriate causal boxes, then we can process and take things further. So, I'll conclude with a couple of examples of Srila Prabhupada and then we can have a few questions. So, when Srila Prabhupada 
went to America. He came to America, it was said, but he was he was 69, all alone. He had practically no money. So Prabhupada came with just 40 rupees to America. And it's very amazing. You know what happened to those 40 rupees? In 1968, when Prabhupada went back to India, he went back by plane and from the airport, when he went to the Ulta Janga Junction where he was staying, he took a rickshaw. And for that rickshaw, he paid those 40 rupees. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Prabhupada came with those 40 rupees. At that time, there are not many Indians. So Indian currency couldn't even get converted very easily to American. So Prabhupada literally came with nothing. He came with no money. He came with no followers. He came with no institutional support. He came with next to no contacts. And when Prabhupada is on the on the coast of the America, he's seeing the the on the Boston Pifier line, he's seeing the skyline of America. He composes a song. And actually, even before that, Prabhupada came with nothing, and the only resource that he had at that time, practically, only material resource was his own body. And that also he had two heart attacks. And he had seasickness and emotion sickness. And then somehow he survived and came. And what is the first line in his in the song that he composed, the prayer to the Lord that he composed? Boro Krupa Koine Krishna Adhamira Prati. So he's saying, Krishna, you are very merciful to me that you have brought me here. Now most of us will say, where is the mercy? <laughs> there is, there is, there is there no money, you know, no followers, you have no institutional support, your body is body is just there, they're recovering from a terrible attack. Where is the mercy? So Prabhupada's vision was, what frame was he putting in? If he wanted to put in the frame, oh, I'm alone, I'm resourceless. He could have said, oh, he just felt sorry for himself. But what was the mercy? Prabhupada felt that at least I have an opportunity to fulfill the instruction of my spiritual master. My spiritual master asked me to uh, share Krishna consciousness in the Western world. And now I had an opportunity. So he has that for us to do anything, we need the opportunity and we need the facility. So, say so for example, now if I'm coming here to your class, so if I'm invited to speak, that's an opportunity. But then if there is no sound system, and there's no facility. So there is opportunity and there's facility. So Prabhupada had no facilities, but he had opportunity. And even for that, he was grateful. So Prabhupada's gratitude is striking. He has nothing and he still wants to be grateful for it. Because he's grateful because he feels that Krishna, you have given me the opportunity to serve you. And because of that opportunity, he's able to he is grateful for the opportunity. And for Prabhupada to get to America was not easy. He's trying for many years. And finally he came to America. So he's grateful. I have this opportunity. And in this session, we are talking about the many forms of surrender. That was the title of the session. So I have not gone directly to surrender. But the, here the point is, before we can surrender, we have to place things in the right causal framework. So if there is a practical cause for something, and I ascribe it to a transcendental cause. Say for example, if I am speaking, and nobody is attentive. Now, I could say that this Kaliuga article is not interesting. <laughs> well, this is the age where nobody is interested. But that could be one explanation that nobody is spiritually interested. Or it could be just that the mic is off, so nobody is able to hear. That's why people are chatting over here. So, when there's a practical explanation, we don't have to go to a philosophical explanation. So, before we can surrender, we have to have the right conception of how do I surrender. So in the case of Ram, although he's God, he's playing the role of a human being. And he surrendered by accepting the inevitable. Okay, I have to go to the forest, I'll go to the forest. And he went gracefully. So there is one way of surrender where we just accept.
swept towards the field goals. The other way of surrender is the Pandavas also had to go to the forest because they were going to honor their lord. But they also knew that the Kauravas are wicked and they will try to destroy us. So in the forest, the Ram more or less was just focusing on spiritual growth. Ram and Sita would be together in the forest, they would have a, they would have a good time and then they would talk with the sages, they would learn from the sages. The Pandavas also did that. But the Pandavas were preparing it. Arjuna did austerities and he caught celestial weapons. Bhima was practicing his mace fighting and Vishtir was learning his apart from his armors, he was also learning gambling. Because they knew that eventually a confrontation would come and they would have to prepare for it. So in this case, so surrender can broadly have two distinct forms. There is dependence on Krishna and there is diligence for Krishna. Dependence on Krishna is, okay, this has happened, this is terrible, but I accept it. And let's see what God has, God has in store for me. I'll, do, I'll just depend on Krishna. So Draupadi's surrender when she was utterly helpless just raised her hand, dependence on Krishna. But the Pandavas when they perform, they try, they work to get better resources for the eventual confrontation. That was diligence for Krishna. So when do we surrender by dependence and when do we surrender by diligence? So, for, so in these three things, uh, there is free there is free will, there, there is free will, evil, and then there is God's will. So if there is nothing that we have done wrong, is there's no misuse of free will, and there is no evil over there, then we can say that okay, there is some higher plan, and let me just do my part right now. So this dependence. But if there is some something which we can do to fix things, if we have acted wrongly, then we need to fix those things. Then it is also diligence for Krishna. So there are some situations where we just call less. We suppose we get a terminal disease. And whatever therapies you have tried, nothing is going to work. Nothing is working. Then you are just dependent on Krishna. Just let me just now absorb myself in Krishna. But we are we are healthy, we are energetic, we are talented, we have inspiration. Then the surrender is by diligence for Krishna. Because the diligence means do our very best that we can. And this alteration between dependence and diligence, this is actually the dance of devotion. The dance of devotion is there are times when we are dependent on Krishna and there are times when we are diligent for Krishna. So when to do what? That depends on which causal framework we are putting, causal box we are putting the situation in. So uh, now let's go back to Prabhupada's example itself. Okay, let's go back to Prabhupada's example itself. Now Prabhupada he concludes his song by saying, "Na chau na chau Prabhu na chau se mate, kachthera putra nijata na chau se mate." That, my dear Lord, make me dance. It's like a puppet here makes a puppet dance. Make me dance. Now at one level there is complete surrender because you're dependent on Krishna. So Prabhupada was dependent. I don't know. There's no facility. What am I going to do? Now whatever you want me to do, Krishna will do it. But along with that, there's also one more thing. Prabhupada was resourceful. Wherever an opportunity came, he took that opportunity. Wherever he got, he took that opportunity, started speaking, and slowly the world started opening. So there is depend so this is. That in every situation that we are in, there are some things in our control, some things beyond our control. In the first session, I talked about balance means the rest of reality and we are in a harmonious situation. So for the things that are in our control, we surrender by diligence for Krishna. And for the things that are not in our control, we surrender by dependence on Krishna. So... Suppose we are giving a class and we are speaking about Krishna, uh, speaking spiritual pluralism to someone. Now, for us, we should organize our thoughts very, very carefully so that we can give the best presentation of the spiritual wisdom that we want to share. That is, in that, we have to be diligent for Krishna. But now, 
Now, what is the mood of the other person? What, how they will take it? That we can't control. On that, for that we are taking the education. Long ago, maybe 20, 25 years ago, when I started speaking for the first time for Krishna, so a senior devotee gave me a list of 10 points of guidelines for speaking in public for Krishna. The last point was depend on Krishna. But in bracket, depend on Krishna, but only after you have the test. <laughs> <laughs> so, even if I had to give a class on dependence on Krishna, I will first have to have diligence for Krishna. <laughs> so, we have both things going on constantly. And learning when to do what? When to have dependence, when to have diligence. That requires placing things in the right causal box. When we place it in the right causal box, then we can move forward. When Shri Prabhupada was in Jhansi, and he had the opportunity to, to build a temple over there. It was a league of devotees. He had started, and he had done it in a very cosmopolitan way. So this was the international headquarters of the league of devotees. And big people from that part of the country had come for the inauguration. But then there was a whole tweak against Prabhupada, and the place which was supposed to be his headquarters, he was getting evicted from there. Now Prabhupada could have fought over that, but he decided it's not worth it. He said, he felt that Jhansi is a too small a city, and the people are more uh, religious than spiritual over here, and there are not many committed, not many committed people over here. So this, it's not a battle worth fighting. Just Krishna will open some other door. So Prabhupada walked away. So Prabhupada here was dependent on Krishna. Krishna will open some other door. But when Prabhupada was in Mumbai and they got the land in June, it was that time, it was remote, but Prabhupada was shrewd enough to see that this is the area that's going to grow. And they got the land, and the person who was selling that land was a double dealing politician. So he took the money and then he was not giving the land people also. So when he tried various nefarious means, he tried to hide, hire some thugs and attack the devotees. So Prabhupada at that time said, no. he has to steal this temple from Krishna, he had to go over my dead body. So, but what? Prabhupada was diligent for Krishna. So at that time, at that time, he already had an international movement. He had devotees, and Mumbai was an important city. It was a very strategically valuable place. So Prabhupada said, "This is a battle worth fighting." So Prabhupada put it in the causal box. So this is the time. This is the time when I have to fight for Krishna. But this is the time when Jhansi put it in the causal box. It's not worth fighting. So when we learn to place things in the most constructive causal boxes. Then we will be able to decide which form of surrender is the most appropriate. Whether it is surrender through dependence or whether it is surrender through diligence. So I'll summarize what I spoke today and then we will have some questions. So I spoke today on this topic of how to process when bad things happen to us. Uh, started by talking about how we can place events in various causal boxes. The same event, a sparrow coming, window is open, the weather is cold, the sparrow population is increasing, the room is unclean. So which causal box we put it in, that is, we have to decide that's our intention. When we are mentally stable, we put it, not necessarily in the, that the causal box we put in is right, but it is the most constructive. But it enables us to do something practical, something constructive about it. And when we are mentally disturbed or mentally unstable, we place events in destructive causal boxes. A glass of water spills from my hand, and I think, what can I do with my life? I'm so useless. So with, with respect to when bad things happen to us, so where is God in that? Why does, does God protect? If he doesn't, what, what, what is he doing? So I talked about how God has created certain operational principles in the world. And usually he doesn't intervene. He can intervene. The, the study of the operational principles of the world 
is science. And God's actions are above science. That's why mirac when if God intervenes, miracles are not against science, they are above science. But a devotee doesn't demand that God intervene repeatedly. That a devotee's idea is that not that my devotion means God will change the rules of the game for me, but that I should play the game as well as I can. And then how is the game played in the world? How do things happen in the world? I talked about the when something happens, there can be three levels of boxes in which we can put it in. What are those three boxes? Three causal boxes? God's will, free will, and evil. So depending on which causal box we are putting it in, we will respond appropriately. So when some bad people do bad things, it is not God doing it. It is they have free will and based on their karma, they have certain freedom. And if within the sphere of control that they have, if we fall in that sphere, sometimes their bad things, bad actions will hurt us. And when that happens, it's not God doing it. So we all have we all have free will and we tend to misuse our free will. That is weakness. But when the misuse of the free will becomes so habitual that we don't even feel bad while doing it, that is wickedness. So for the for weakness, there can be forgiveness. But for wickedness, to give forgiveness may be foolishness. We need punishment over it. So based on which causal box a particular action is put in, is it just I was foolish because of this happened? You should be careful. So you wish to did that. Right? Okay. I, I was un naive and I was exploited over here. I'll not be naive in future. And he learned gambling. When Ram was sent to the forest, he put in a causal box that this is destiny. Destiny means I said that normally we simply see the linear correlation between my actions and my res result. But our action alone doesn't produce the result. It is Talent plus commitment that leads to achievement. So we could say our present action is commitment. But talent is largely by destiny, what we get from our past karma. So sometimes that is just invisible and sometimes that is visible. We eat food, we just normally get energy. Sometimes we eat food, we don't get any energy. So if we understand, so Ram puts it in the causal box of destiny so that he doesn't feel resentful towards Kaiti and he goes gracefully to the forest. And he focuses primarily on spiritual enrichment. He just accepts it. This has happened. Let's move on. But the Pandavas go to the forest. They know the Kauravas are wicked. And they have to prepare. So Ram is God. But he exhibits here surrender by dependence on Krishna. Dependence on the Lord. Acceptance and dependence. Okay. I accept it. Let's see what good comes out of marriage. And with respect to the Pandavas, they exhibit surrender by diligence for Krishna. Based on, we surrender, if something is in our control, we surrender by doing it the best that we can, that's diligence. And when something is beyond our control, we surrender by dependence. And if we learn to place things in the right causal boxes, then we will know how best to surrender in what situation. And in the last session, in the evening, I'll talk about both these forms of surrender, dependence and diligence. Now, how can they be practically implemented? In when we face difficulties, we'll draw about towards the conclusion of both these incidents, Ramayana and Mahabharata, the conclusive war, and in that we will discuss this. So, are there any questions or comments? Uh, hi, Krishna Prabhu. Uh, so, Ram was able to uh, actually see the actions of Karthi as destiny uh, because. He knew that Kaiti was uh, not wicked. But on the other hand, uh, Yudhishthir uh, was actually preparing uh, for to become better at gambling because he knew uh, Duryodhan was wicked. So, uh, so if we try to compare uh, these two situations, uh, the response was dependent on their assessment of whether the person who caused it was wicked or uh, uh, it was caused due to weakness. So how do we, uh, you know, what are the principles for us to actually determine whether someone is being wicked and we need to prepare or someone is doing out of weakness, we just have to forgive and move on. So, uh, like, call it as destiny. How do we, uh, it's a good question. 
So how do we know whether the company is doing something because of weakness or because of wickedness? It's tough, but broadly, there is falls in three categories. See, the action, what comes before the action, and what comes after the action. That means generally, when somebody succumbs to weakness, it is largely impulsive. It is not premeditated. If there is premeditation, then it's it's usually wickedness. So now you could say, was Kaikai's action premeditated? Yes, but it is only for one night. That mantra influenced her. But if something something which somebody does that requires a lot of planning and coordination and it's a conspiracy. It's so that there can be there can be a crime and there can be a conspiracy. A crime can just be you there's an opportunity to rob something. I just uh, see a bag lying on the ground and I think that hey, nobody's here. Let me steal it. That's a crime. Steal it. But if somebody makes a whole plan how to rob a bank and they do this and do this and do this and this, that's a conspiracy. So we can look at premeditation. And we can use our own intelligence to understand uh, for doing this, what all would be required? One is premeditation. So before the action, what all is required? Second is that after the action. So, so if you just look at the action, it's very difficult to know whether because whether this is because of weakness or wickedness. Then after the action, is there any remorse? Is there any apology? Is there any reformation? Or at least is there a desire for that? So what is the attitude after they do it? If they justify it, hey, this is just the way it is. So accept it or get out of the way, whatever. If they are not at all apologetic or even remorseful, then that's also an indicator that this is not just weakness. Now again, you see, any kind of analytical category we use, life is much more complicated than any analytical framework that we use. So it could be that some person might have wickedness without themselves being wicked. That means in one particular action they behave wickedly. But others they might be they might be okay. So it's but broadly this is this is a broad categorization. It's not a exhaustive classification of uh, uh, not everybody will neatly fall into weak or, weak or wicked. But this is our understanding. So the, the remorse. And the third would be repetition. If they keep repeating it again and again and again, you know, what is I saying? That fool me, cheat me once, okay, cheat me once, and I'm a victim. Cheat me twice, and you are a cheat. Cheat me thrice, and I am a fool. So that means if somebody keeps doing the same thing again and again and they don't they don't try to reform and they just keep accepting that, then it's it's something we have to we have to check. So we can look at what all is the history. If it's being repeated again and again and again, then that's something which is much more serious. So premeditation, uh, presence of premeditation, presence of remorse and the presence of repetition. That's three things we can see to differentiate. Any other questions? Yes. Um, you explained uh, two forms of surrender. Uh, one is uh, dependence on Krishna and then diligence to Krishna. And then how one places the events in the appropriate causal boxes mm. to determine the form of surrender. Right? Uh, so practically, I think whether people you know who are able to always place the events in the appropriate boxes or some who don't, I don't think they would use this framework you know at that time. It's more of the intelligence and the wisdom, right? Okay. So how does one develop practically this wisdom and uh, uh, the intelligence so that on autopilot, right, you are always able to or most of the time able to place things in the right causal boxes and then do the right form of surrender. Yes. So we can't really do all this analysis when events happen to us. So how can we make it more habitual? 
That's why it's uh, something uh, which comes by association. If we if we see a particular event, so we see in Prabhupada's life also, when Prabhupada was trying everything and his business was collapsing, his family was not doing well, and everything that he was trying, it was not working. And then Prabhupada says, I met my god brother, and my god brother told me this verse in the Bhagavata. That for one whom I am very merciful, Krishna says, I take everything away from them so that they have nothing except me. So, everything can be used in the service of Krishna, but everything can also become a distraction from Krishna. So, sometimes Krishna may give us everything so that we can use it in the service, and sometimes Krishna may take everything away so that we just give ourselves without any distraction. So, what happened is Prabhupada, when he read this verse, Prabhupada takes a letter. Illuminating for him. This, this makes sense of it. So even for Prabhupada, we see from an example is association. Generally, hearing from others, it just helps us understand in what causal boxes people are putting things. So listening to others, even listening to people who disagree with us, who think differently from us, Listening to people can be very interesting if we are really listening. Now, really listening means that we are not just listening to argue, to respond, uh, to, to, to defend, to, but just okay, trying to understand. And especially if we, have some, if we have some spiritual friends, spiritual guides, they can give us the constructive frameworks to put it. And if we keep staying in the association like that, then gradually we develop that ability. So for, it usually, for major decisions in life, association is important. Guidance and association are important. And as we study scripture, internalize scripture, then that placing things in the right framework starts happening more and more. Sometimes we can also learn from experience that sometimes what happens, we do something wrong and we just beat ourselves. Why did I do that? So we might decide that, okay, I'm, I'm not going to oversleep or I'm not going to overeat. And then we end up doing that. And we might just wait ourselves. Why did I do that? Why am I so lazy? Or why am I so foolish? Whatever. But instead of just beating ourselves up, we can think at that time, you know, what did I think? Uh, maybe the mind plays, we woke up, and the mind said, actually, you know, today it's very cold. Or maybe you slept too late. Or you'll fall sick if you don't sleep enough. So the mind gives some justification. So that is the causal framework in which the causal box in which the mind put it. So what causal box can we put it? So we, we can, even if we can't catch it at that time, at least if we catch it later, then next time we'll become more alert to catch it. Otherwise, what happens is if we don't introspect and learn, then we just beat ourselves up. I keep doing foolish things. No, but it's the same mind. And if we don't understand how our mind is tricking us, then what happens? Just keep doing the same thing again and again. Therefore, tomorrow repeats yesterday. Tomorrow just replays yesterday. And that, that's not healthy. So try to, if you, so we get intelligence, we get association from this guidance. We can ourselves use our experience to see. see what, is the, what is the reasoning over here? There's a false reasoning, but it's still the reasoning. And then try to place it in a different causal framework. And if there are certain causal frameworks that are very powerful for us, which are very illuminating, then we can write them down. Write, write down some illuminating points and then keep those available. And then we look at it. Oh, okay, this is how it is. Can I ask you a question? Thank you. Okay. So, Moral is your answer, but I want to just clarify. Uh, suppose someone is sick because everybody has predefined exercises. What is the best constructive framework uh, to think about cause of the framework? So somebody is wicked. Uh, if somebody is behaving wicked towards you. Okay. So if somebody is behaving wickedly with us, then what 
do we do? Broadly, when something like this happens to us, we have three options. We call it as tolerate, mitigate, or emigrate. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you might just decide, this is the way the person is. Uh, yes, their behavior is troubling me, but it is not an unbearable trouble. It is manageable. And everybody else is also like, everybody else has, is, everybody has some, some deficiencies. And their deficiencies hurt others. So if it is tolerable, just tolerate it. And I don't want to put too much energy on it. Just let me move on with my life. It will be unpleasant. But then, wherever we go, there will always be some people who will be unpleasant. That's just the way life is. Tolerate. That's one way to do it. Mitigate is, it's normal. This is unacceptable. I have to fight you. Then you may decide this is the battle I want to fight. I have to fix this. And then, if that is that is important for us, and it's not just, it's, they're not just hurting us, they're also hurting others, and it has to be corrected. Then we take the responsibility. Each choice will bring with it its own consequences. Tolerate means we will have to develop a thicker skin. Mitigate means we may have to get involved in all the complexities. When you try to fix things, it, it is complex. Then if we if we feel strongly driven to let me do that. If it's if no, I have better things, I can't bear this, but I don't want to get involved in this fight also. And I have better things to do in my life. I don't want to focus on that. Let me do it. Then we just maybe move out of that service. If somebody else do that service, we move out of that area. It can be geographically, it can be emotionally, it can be whatever. Right? But move out of it. And you see, Prabhupada also adopted different approaches. When he was staying in, in the place of the other walls, when he first came, there was meat in the same fridge. And Prabhupada was a pure vegetarian. But Prabhupada said, think nothing about it. They were apologetic, but Prabhupada said, think nothing about it. He was there dependent on them. That was the only option. So, fine, tolerate. But later on, when devotees, he was training them to cook food. If a chapati did not come out properly, swe properly swelling, Prabhupada said, This is not the way to cook. Go and cook it. Cook it like Prabhupada showed him how to cook. So, he was mitigated. But then, we see, as I said, we give the example of Jhansi. It is not worth the fight. Prabhupada immigrated from there. So, I think it's important. The decision how we make to tolerate, mitigate, and immigrate is based on purpose. What is the most important thing for us? And how does this particular person's action affect that which is most important for us? If that most important thing, or the most or more important things can go on, then this I tolerate. But if the most interrupted thing is still being interrupted, then you either have to mitigate or immigrate. Thank you, Jeet and Karan, for the amazing class on the exactly forms of self. Uh, so, Prabhu, I was thinking on the terms of the two forms of self that you mentioned, like whether it's dependent on Krishna or intelligence or Krishna. So, is there any hierarchy that dependence on Krishna is higher than intelligence? Or and the second question was that when you are kind of taking the second form of intelligence on Krishna, is there a way that you at some point of time, there may be a possibility that you may no longer depend on Krishna and try to handle the situation on your own and okay, you know, so it is, I mean, elaborating the next question, is there in the practicalities? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. There's one question you had in it. So I'll answer that. Hmm. Uh, ask me for the last. I'll, I'll just answer it. You want to keep it? Okay. Okay, I know the question. <laughs> okay, this is like a match fixing. <laughs> so, if we have some problem that is constantly nagging us, and then we are not sure uh, what to do about it. We have been trying to deal with it, but it's just not going away. And we're not sure whether what we're doing is the right thing or not the right thing. So, what do we do at that time? Again, to some extent, the answer will come in the next session. But here I'll briefly mention that problems are such that 
at one level life determines the problem for us but it's our mind that determines the size of the problem so there might be some person who is very irritated who is very irrit irritating towards us there might be some situation which is troubling us but and now we can keep thinking about that constantly that will completely drain and de-energize us so if some situation is there which is is not immediately changeable then one thing we can do is see the mind is like a child in some ways the mind is more worried whether there is a solution then what is the solution <laughs> whether there is a solution then what is the solution you know, the, 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 maybe the child sees some fire over there the child says oh, fire fire the mother says no, we'll take care of it now the child is not worried okay you are going to get a fire extinguisher and you are going to put the fire so mother says take care i'll take care of it yeah. so like that we need to treat the mind like a child and decide that okay if there's an unsolvable problem which we have to live with then decide some time every day to do what it takes to attend to it and the remaining time don't talk about it don't think about it also as much as possible so if like say somebody has got an incurable disease or somebody has uh, maybe lost their job or somebody is in a part whatever it is issue so then it's there everybody knows about it but if we constantly think and talk about it it world it crushes us but the whole family who is dealing with that situation the whole group of people are dealing with that situation we cannot deny it completely but we can't let it dominate us so let's decide a time that okay every day in 15 minutes in the evening or in the morning this is what the situation is and a b c d this is what we can do about it so what happens is basically we we put a boundary around the problem we can't remove the problem But we put a boundary around it. Now this is also not easy because the mind will go towards it. But that's a strategy. If we keep thinking and keep talking about it, it will crush us. So, and then there, once we put a boundary, we are not running away from it. We are not denying it, but we are giving some time for it. And after we give some time for it, during that time, just discuss whatever needs to be discussed candidly, and then again focus on constructing. What can we do about it? Okay, this this is incurable. But then, or maybe it's curable in future. We don't know. Right now, this is what we have. So these are the things we can do. Like this, today you do this, you do this, you do this. And then remaining time, try to have something constructive and purposeful to do. Maybe it is not to deal with that problem. Maybe it's not going to solve that problem. But that problem, uh, just because one problem is unsolvable, doesn't mean we should stop solving other problems in our life. but that's what happens when we let the problem dominate us so actually in the next session i i introduce this concept that krishna is not the cause of our suffering we talk about cause comforter and cure so krishna can i talk about how krishna can provide us comfort amid the problems but okay i have to think about this problem let me think about it what what is necessary and what is feasible and let me do other things at that so that way the problem won't nag us constantly so compartmentalize it set some boundaries around it so that it doesn't dominate our entire life and we all need a sense of self worth and a sense of success so sometimes when we are facing a problem that is unsolvable and then facing that problem itself we are trying and trying and trying and nothing is happening we get so discouraged that we give up so and we stop doing other things also so try to find out something some area in which we can move forward and then that gives us some sense of confidence some sense of self worth yes okay this problem is unsolvable but that doesn't mean i am useless so the mind this is a destructive framework the problem is unsol unsolvable therefore i am useless this is a destructive causal box which the mind is using so now to sometimes now i talk all this about analysis in the next session i'm going to talk about it just it's not all in the head we have to get out of the head and get into the world so the, we have to be able to show the mind evidence that i am not useless yeah i could so fix this issue but i have fixed this 
I can link this link. So find some area in which we can do for that and do something tangible in that. And then by that, we will uh, we will not be so disheartened or so crushed by the problem. And sometimes that problem may stay for some time. It's like many problems that come in our life. They are, as I said, sometimes they come by destiny, by past karma. And some problems are like leeches. Now when a leech comes and bites and he sucks blood. So when they, now, I gave this example in a class in Florida and after that one devotee, an American devotee said, I had this actual experience. He said that when a leech comes and bites, sometimes the leech is so strong that if you try to pull out the leech, the leech will pull out the whole skin. So at that time, what do you do? You just let the leech do its business. Hey, it's sucking my blood. How can I let it do its business? But no, it doesn't have unlimited capacity to suck the blood. It has finite tubules, and once its tubules are full, it will extract the blood. And then you might it will fall off itself, or you split it off and fall off. So sometimes, by karma, we have to go through some difficulties and overreacting to them. We like trying to pull it out. That means sometimes giving up our ethics, giving up our spiritual values, spiritual practices, just so that I can deal with this problem. We may have to contextualize, we may we decrease some spiritual practices to focus on that particular aspect. That's fine. But just extreme reactions, we are like and pull out the leech. No, just accept it. Just deal with it for a time. But to live with it, we have to have something else which makes our life worth living. We may have to we may have to live with something. But we should also be living for some things. Live with means I accept. But live for means this is where I am going for. This is where I am doing something worthwhile. So that way what happens is once we have something to live for, some area in which we are moving, then we may have to live with pain, but we won't have to live in pain. That problem will be there with us. But the problem would overwhelm us. It's, it's a part of my life. I accept it. If, I, if that play problem overwhelms me, overwhelms me, then I have nothing to live for. And then life becomes unbearable. Does that answer your question? Okay. One last question. Okay, we have two. In what time should we go to? Okay, okay last two questions. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. So just from yesterday's class, uh, one point you mentioned about the obedience. So both uh, Mahabharata and Ramayana, uh, the things we can learn from is the obedience or the authority. So now, practically now, uh, what should we expect in this current day, especially like uh, dealing with uh, my own kids or my own family or, or even in the workplace? There are different levels of authorities, but sometimes we see this obedience, sometimes we don't see. Then sometimes, being obedient also, it's a questionable thing. Whether so, how do we take the values from these two scriptures? How do we practically apply this? That's one question. And the other one. Let's take uh, one question at a time. <laughs> so uh, now, say the, both the ethics talk about obedience to elders. So should we expect such obedience from our children, say, or uh, should we just also exhibit such obedience towards our Authorities also. Obedience is an important value. At the same time, it's not the supreme value. The supreme value is our devotion, our spirituality. And we have in the Bhagavatam the opposite examples on many occasions. In fact, the Bhagavatam inverts traditional hierarchies repeatedly. Inverts. How is that? We have the traditional hierarchy is that the Guru should be obeyed by the disciple. But Bali Maharaj, he disobeys Shukracharya. And that is his devotion. That's, it's considered glorious for that. This is, you say this is glorious disobedience. <laughs> no, it is not disobedience that is glorious. It is his devotion that is glorious. And for that, he is ready to even disobey. In fact, I have a whole class on seminar on how. There are eight examples in the Bhagavatam of conventional hierarchies being inverted. 
and that is the evidence of the potency of the emotion. So hierarchies are important, but the purpose of the hierarchy is also important. The purpose of the hierarchy is to favor spiritual growth and uh, to further spiritual growth. If that is not happening, then the hierarchies are can become constrictive and destructive also. In today's world, parenting is a big challenge. There's, I think, Mark Twain, he said something like this, that when I was 15, my father was a fool. Now I'm 25, and I'm amazed how much the old guy has learned in the last 10 years. <laughs> 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 now, it's not necessarily the father has learned, but the way a child, a person thinks at 15, the way the person thinks at 25 is so different. When you start taking responsibility, at that time, you start realizing those who take responsibility, they're taking a lot of challenges. Then you become much more empathic towards them. So it's a phase. And the most important thing is that we try to love unconditionally. That means that love naturally will come with expectations. There can be academic expectations, there can be behavioral expectations, there can be spiritual expectations. And to some extent, it's natural and necessary that parents shape their children. So it's understandable. But whereas love naturally will mean expectations, but love shouldn't be conditional to expectations. Especially in that context. Yes, it is wonderful if you do this, but even if you don't do this, I am with you. Now, how I am with you, that may vary according to time, place, circumstance. What form our support goes to that. But that's important for us. So I talked earlier about like depend diligence and dependence. So generally, till the in the children are very small, I mean in the babies or they are small children, and at that time the parents have to have diligence. In the parenting, you fight like a, you stand like a warrior, protecting your children from everything. But when the children go into teenage years, then when did my sweet little child disappear? Who is this? Ah, non-communicative, rude, sullen. Teenager has come into place. Sometimes at that phase in the teenage, you know, you have to go from diligence to dependence. <laughs> <laughs> so it's 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 actually for them also it's very difficult. See, they are the children in teenage are searching for an identity. What happens when the, in the preteens their identity is inextricably tied to their parents? Like, oh, you are this this person's son or this person's daughter or whatever. Now, when they will become adults, they will have their own identity. I have this job. I have this degree, I have my own identity. In the teens, they are too old to be satisfied with being identified simply as their parents' children. And they are too young to have an identity of their own. So to be identity less like that, it is very disorienting. And on top of that, there is a time when the hormones start getting activated, puberty sets in. It's, it's a stormy phase. So I was, uh, I, I, one of my services was writing. So I read one uh, author who guides people how to write memoirs. Now how to write your own life story. Somebody might say that, actually, there's nothing worth telling in my life story. So this author says, if you have survived adolescence, you have enough to write a book. <laughs> Adolescence, the, that, is a, that is a stormy period. So even if they sometimes behave unreasonably, uh, don't take it too personally. It's a, we need to put it in a causal framework. Every time when our children do, do something which is, uh, which is bad, then we may take it as a personal failure. Did I fail in my parenting? It might be, and it's always good to try to learn. But sometimes taking things too personally will prevent us from acting appropriately at that time. So if we are too caught in our own insecurity, maybe I failed as a parent. Maybe, it could, could be, but maybe not. You see that they are going through their own issues. 
and when they give unreasonable leave, it's like if somebody is a mentally unstable. I, I gave this example in a class in Bhakti Center, and then there was one American lady, she said, we had an experience like this. She said she was in a shopping mall, and suddenly somebody just attack, slapped her on the face. And they said, this is a heavy, it is quite a hard hit. And she looked around, and then she was so angry. But then she looked around and saw that there is, um, it was like a teenage, it was like a teenager, uh, maybe 20, uh, 20, 25 years old, but he had um, Down syndrome. And he just wanted her attention. And as soon as she saw that he was like this, all the anger disappeared. She like just smiled at him and I just nodded my head. And he also smiled and nodded my head. He just got it. So I was like, oh, I, I, how dare you hit me like this? But the, so, so what is happening is, if we put it in the right framework, like adolescence is a very difficult period. They are struggling to go through it. And sometimes we don't know what to do, but they also don't even know what to do. So we want to help and we try our best to help. But if things are going wrong, don't take it too personally. Just be there to help in whatever way is possible. And that is a phase. Once the hormones are settled down a little bit, once they start carving out their own identity, things will become better. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. The last question again. Hi, Krishna Prabhuji. Um, really like the point about the three spheres based on free will, uh, evil, and God's will, based on each person's karma. Um, I have I have this friend who was mentioning like you know why why do we have to believe in God or astrology if we can see the direct. Um, we, we have a scientific reason to explain that incident, but because of, uh, like, say somebody gets into an accident, you know, you know, driver was drunk, okay, reason is right there, but then that reduces their, that increases their faith that there must be a scientific explanation for everything, and God is not required. So how do we... Uh, deal with such people who feel that, you know, if there is a scientific explanation for something, there must be a scientific explanation for everything, and God is not required. That's a big question. Are you coming with a Hindi? Yes. Okay. What should I do? Should I answer now? Hindi. Okay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> there is no scientific answer to this. <laughs> okay, I'll try to answer as quickly as I can. But don't blame me if it becomes a class. <laughs> <laughs> so people who feel that if there's a scientific explanation, then why do we need any other explanation such as God? There's a difference between a correct explanation and a complete explanation. So scientific explanation is a correct explanation. But is it the complete explanation? Uh, I have worked with uh, devotees who are doctors. And they say that sometimes we have two patients same disease, for the same financial background, same social cultural, social cultural background, and we give the medicine, and one person gets cured, and the other person doesn't get cured. So what is going on? Now they may try to say this person's immunity was low, but many times they look at the other parents and they are more or less similar. So, so we we do not deny the correctness of scientific explanation. What we are concerned about is the completeness. That is it the complete explanation? So two people might be staying in the same house and more or they eat the same food, they breathe the same air, they sleep on the similar beds, same bed, whatever. One of them gets malaria, the other doesn't get malaria. Maybe the mosquito bit both of them. But why did one get malaria, the other didn't get malaria? <laughs> so malaria is definitely a cause and it is a correct cause. But is it the complete cause? So the, so the scientific and the, you could say spiritual explanations, they are not contradictory. They can very well be complementary. Just like uh, if somebody is playing a billiards match. Now, in billiards, if a particular ball goes into the hole, you could give a scientific explanation. Okay, now this ball 
hit this set of balls from this angle at this velocity with this momentum, and that caused this ball to move this way, that caused the ball to move that way, and then that ball ended up in the hole. We could give an explanation based on the laws of physics for it, and that's a valid explanation. If you're looking at the board itself, at the billiards board, yeah, that's a valid explanation. But if you expand the framework, then we will see that there is a player. And it's a player's skill because of which the ball went into the hole. So now both explanations are true. Now, when to use a mechanical explanation, in this case, and when to use a personal explanation. Sometimes the player might be very skilled, but if the player's pick is uh, is uh, weak or it's broken, then it will not, although the player is skilled, the ball will not go into the hole. So life is uh, complex. And science gives, explains things at a particular level of reality. And we accept that. So science is like one causal box. And in many cases, that causal box is enough. But in many cases, that causal box may not be enough. So we are not denying the validity of the causal box of science. But we are considering whether it is the, it is the only, only valid box. So science offers one degree of explanation, that's valid. But is it the only explanation or not? So if somebody has the idea that or we will just uh, appeal to God and not do anything practical, that is not the way actual devotion works. When Arjuna was fighting a war, he was not thinking, let Krishna help me win the war. He was fighting himself. So in this case, there was the personal explanation and there was the function, there was the, the spiritual explanation that we know that he was guided by God, but he was skilled and empowered by his own abilities also. So we basically see God not as a substitute for science, not as a replacement for science, but God is actually uh, the foundation for everything, including science. God is not the control of this. God is not the explanation of the unexplainable. God is the explain. God is not just the explanation for the unexplainable. He is also the explanation for explainability. So why does nature work according to laws? Science presumes the existence of those laws and discovers those laws. But why should nature work according to any laws at all? That is ultimately indicative of higher intelligence operating within nature. So basically, science and uh, the scientific and spiritual explanations, they are explanations at different levels. And the scientific explanation can be correct without necessarily being complete. And the spiritual explanation can be correct without necessarily contradicting or minimizing the scientific explanation. Thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada Ki, Gaur Bhakta Gandaki, Jai Gaur Sri Mandi.